I, then, I'm, then, I'm still tired. <laughs> 10 years later, don't, isn't it amazing where time, that was 2006. You guys were in high school, maybe? Middle school? Born yet? <laughs> and the amazing thing is Chan Bailey obviously went to the University of Georgia. Uh, I call him the top dog because he is, yes, UGA. He is uh, one of the greatest players that ever come from Georgia. He was actually my teammate for a little bit with the Saints this past year. So it's funny, you know, we, we, we walk around um, the locker room and guys are like, hold on, weren't you that guy that been knocked out? You know, 10 years ago, they're pulling up the play on YouTube. You see, there was no high def back then. You can barely see what was going on, so. That's amazing. We were gonna talk about this a little while uh, later, but uh, while we're on the topic, so you were telling me your dad wrote a whole sermon series based on that, like a yeah. proud father. Tell us, like, <laughs> what, what, what makes you run 99 when everybody else ain't running? What, what makes you, like, give us some thoughts behind that play, if you would. Well, like many of you, I grew up, you know, my parents taught me to give 100% in everything that I do. My mom's over there and, and my father. Whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly for the Lord, not for men. So. Growing up, it was always about finishing whatever you started. It was about giving 100, uh, giving effort. And then at University of Georgia, there was a time when we were playing Clemson University. And uh, we were playing Clemson University, and it was the first game of the season, I think, and our running back fumbled the ball, right? And it was on the 50-yard line, and their defensive end picked the ball up, ran it all the way in for a touchdown, and everybody on offense just sat there and watched him run into the end zone. So Coach Mark Richt, um, wasn't very happy about that. So the next day in practice, we didn't even practice, we just ran. We ran and we ran and, he, and we ran. And he said, you never give up. You chase the guy who, got, who has the ball if it's, if it's a defensive player. So fast forward, later that season, we're playing Alabama, your school. We beat them that year though, <laughs> as we have many years. And uh, the same thing happened. How many uh, national championships does Georgia have? How many do you have? 17. How many do you have? Do I have? Yes. No, I'm, I'm a flame now, so we just made it into the playoffs for the first oh, okay. time. All right, all right, okay. Did you know that, uh, by the way? Well, congratulations. Uh, you know, can I finish my story? Please. All right, thank you. So, the linebacker picks the ball off, and I chase him. It's 100 degrees in Tuscaloosa. People are passing down the stands. I chase him and catch him on the one yard line to find out that the play was blown dead 50 yards ago. So I'm on oxygen, but the point is, it was ingrained in me <laughs> to always chase. So when we got to, to the Patriots, you know, I, it, it was the same thing. That play happened in, in, the, in the, the playoffs, and um, I felt it was on all of us to try to catch them. And I was also mad because Tommy hadn't thrown me a touchdown that game. So I, I figured I'd take my frustration out on somebody. <laughs> That's amazing. Man, uh, tell us about your upbringing, just your family, especially in, in, with your mom being here. We'd love to tell you, just hear a little bit about your family and just, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm the oldest of six kids. Um, yeah, that lady over there is special. I'm the oldest of six kids. Um, I'm 34, my youngest brother's 15 years younger than me. Um, we're four boys, two girls, so we grew up in a household that had a lot going on. Um, but my parents uh, loved the Lord, and my father, uh, I grew up in Norfolk, Virginia. I was actually born in Norfolk, Virginia. Yep, 757, yeah. Back in, the, back in the day, it was the 804. Y'all might not remember that, but yeah, okay, all right. So I grew up, I'm a Virginia boy. I heard a lot about liberty growing up. And so um, I grew up always, you know, playing sports. We used to play football out in the yard, out, um, you know, in the street, tackling on the sidelines, stuff like that. Um, but I, I really was I'm very close to my brothers and sisters and, and, and my parents, you know, they, they set a great example of what it meant to, um, you know, followed the Lord wholeheartedly. My father is, is a pastor now. Um, and so we moved to South Carolina, actually, when I was in high school. My dad went down to uh, plant a church, which he now pastors in, in, in Rock Hill, South Carolina, a, a town outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, you got people from everywhere in here, huh? Liberty is worldwide. And then we moved, and then we moved to uh, Zimbabwe and... Uh, Then, then we took a trip to the moon and <laughs> golly, worldwide in here, universe wide. So I went to high school. I went to high school in Rock Hill, South Carolina, a school called Northwestern. Um, but always involved in sports growing up. Always involved in um, FCA and things like that. Our family vacations growing up were Fellowship of Christian Athletes camps. My my father would go speak at different places around the country, and we would all pack into our little our little car all. 
eight of us pack into the car and we would drive around the country and those would kind of be like our little vacations. I was, when I was a kid, I was kind of like the FCA mascot, you know, running around the camps with all the college kids, so. Yeah, that's amazing. So obviously a Christian heritage and a strong Christian home. How did you come to know the Lord? Yeah, well, I, uh, it, it, was, it was kind of a, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to get up to stand, tell yeah. this story. So when I, was, when I was about five years old or so, I grew up in a Christian house, as I, as I talked about before, and I, I knew about the Lord, but there comes a point where you feel the Spirit calling you and where God reaches out to you, because the Bible says that, you know, we, we turn to him, we repent of our sins, but we can't come to him unless he calls us. So when I was about five or six years old, my father had this teddy bear that was about this big, and I was only about this big. And my dad is about the same size as me. You know, maybe a little shorter because he's a little older. You know, you shrink when you get older. But big dude, he was always the guy with the big muscles. He's the reason why I wanted to play football and wanted to work out because my dad, he played football at University of Maryland, big guy. So I'm going to stop saying things so y'all can stop. So, <laughs> so anyway, we, uh, we're, we, he would take this teddy bear. And before I would go to bed at night, sometimes he would say, Benjamin, do you want to fight the teddy bear? Yeah, yeah, daddy, I want to fight the teddy bear. So he'd say, okay. He'd get behind the teddy bear, and he would box me. You know, I'm a little kid. He would box me with the teddy bear. You know, he hit me in the face. and knocked. I think he was trying to see. It had been a while since he played football, so I think he was trying to take out his aggression on his son in some way. I don't, I don't understand, but he would get behind the teddy bear and fight me with the teddy bear. And sometimes he let me win, but there was one night, as the story goes, I fought the teddy bear, I lost, and I went to bed, and I was in my bed screaming, Daddy, you bring that teddy bear back here. You bring that, I'm not going to bed top be And he leaned over and told my mom, this boy has a serious competition problem, you know? <laughs> so he brings the teddy bear back out, he lets me win. And, and that night, he said, Benjamin, you know, if you were to die tonight, you know, you're asleep. And I knew the right answer, but I didn't know it for myself. And he shared with me John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish of everlasting life. And right there at about five, six years old is when I repented of my sins and put my faith and trust in Jesus. And so, as you know, there is a process, there's a sanctification process that happens over your life. So that was my first real encounter, knowing that I'm a sinner, I need what Christ did on the cross for my salvation and turning and, and, and repenting at that young age. But since then, you know, it's been a process of getting to, to know the Lord and, and getting to have my full faith and trust in Him. And it hasn't been, it hasn't been without, without trials and tribulations, but it's been a process of growing and knowing the Lord and becoming more and more like Christ. But I point back to that time when my dad was behind that teddy bear, fighting me with the teddy bear with my first real encounter. That's amazing, man. And so, obviously, you come into the Lord, you, you go through college, and, um, and, then, and then the next level, the NFL. I'd love to hear just the, the, the things that the Lord has been teaching you when you mix fame and faithfulness together. And uh, tell us a little bit about your football career, and then just being a believer. Uh, one of the things that I read one time about you was that you gave everybody on your team a Bible uh, as a Christmas gift. And so, just moments like that, we'd love to hear some thoughts and perspective on just as a believer walking through that? Well, when you're a believer, you are, that is, that is who you are in your essence, and what you do with your life is simply what you do. You are a Christian. You are a believer. You are a child of God. You are all those things, and what you do is become a doctor. What you do is become a lawyer. What you do is, you know, teach, be a pastor. What, you, what I do is play football. I'm a professional football player, so, so that doesn't change who I am. But just what I do doesn't change who I am and who God sees me as. And so a lot of times we, you know, separate the two, but we are God's children. We are Christians first, and then what we do flows from that. So um, for me, I, I, I was drafted in, in 2004 to the New England Patriots. <laughs> Bandwagoners. I was drafted to New England Patriots. I played there for six years. Um, you know, it, it was a great six years. You know, it taught me a lot. I tore my ACL my, my first year there. And many of you who, you know, have gone through something like that, you know how tough that is. And that was a hard time for me. You know, here I am 
uh, got drafted number 32, 32nd pick to the, to the world champion Patriots. Um, we go and go to another Super Bowl that year, win the Super Bowl, and I can't play. And I was so frustrated. I, I was doing rehab. I'm sitting there in Boston where I'm coming from Georgia. I'd never seen that much snow before. There's eight feet of snow on the ground. I am miserable. I'm being a jerk to my family when they come around because I felt like my self-worth was all wrapped up in football. And one of the things that I've learned over my career, um, and one of the things that I've tried to pass on to, to the guys that are younger than me is, and I'm passing on to you, is to make sure you know your identity is in Christ so that when you get laid off from your job or when your job, you get a raise from your job or when you do something else, things don't go right, you're not up and down and up and down. And, and that's how I was. You know, and, and one of the hardest things for me that I've learned throughout my career um, is, is that my identity is in him. That's something that is constantly has to be pounded in the, in, the, in the professional football because we are judged on what we do every single day. Every single day we go to practice, we come in, we watch the film of practice. You did this right, you did this wrong. You play a game, the same thing. There was always uh, the feeling of, am I going to make it this year? Am I going to make it this week? Is somebody going to take my job? And, and, and so if you're not grounded, you're going to be uh, all over the place. You're going to be like a leaf being blown, blown by the wind. And so, um, you know, I went to Cleveland next, the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> hey, Cleveland fans, you see the Cleveland fans jumped up now. They don't play. They've been through a lot, but they're, they're loyal. I tell you that much. So I went to Cleveland, and Cleveland was really um, a place of spiritual growth for me. I was with uh, a few guys who got me up early in the morning, praying at 6, 6 a.m. in the morning. Um, some guys that really showed me um, what it meant to, to really be a father, to be, to be a believer in the locker room. Um, some guys that really stretched me. Some guys that I feel like in many ways were a little more mature than me. And it's amazing how God brought me from New England, who was at the top of the football world, to Cleveland, who was at the bottom at the time. And how that year, that first year in Cleveland, me and my wife point to as a real um, growth point and turning point. You know, and then I move over to the New Orleans Saints. I see a... Who that? Okay, we got a few. We got a few in here. And, um, and, and at this point in my career, I'm, I'm, my 10th and 11th year, I feel like I, I, I'm at a place where I'm more of a, of a mentor in some ways. And, and you mentioned the Bible thing. That was last year uh, during Christmas. My wife and I uh, snuck in and the kids. We have four kids. Um, and, they're, and they're five and a half and younger. Four kids. Yeah. Two, mi two minute drill, baby. Two minute drill. We just going at it, right? Just going at it. My, my wife is a trooper now. She, she's, she got the S on her chest, superwoman. Uh, so we all go into the locker room on Christmas Eve, and we put Bibles in everyone's locker. Yeah, and, and that was something that, that a teammate of mine had done before um, in New England, actually, and, and I just thought it was a way. And the amazing thing is, you know, a lot of times people ask me about that specific event and say, well, what about the guys on the teams who, are, who aren't Christian? Or what about the guys who, um, you know, did you get any pushback? And the amazing thing is that the guys who, who you would think that would have nothing to do with the Bible with the first one saying, oh my goodness, it's the greatest thing somebody's ever given me. Yeah. And we never know the seed that we plant when that will bear fruit. You're called to be faithful. You're called to do what God has asked you to do. And at that point, it was giving Bibles to my team. I don't know if 20 years down the line, they're going to finally open that Bible. I don't know if they opened it already. That's right. But when we're obedient, God promises that his word won't return void. And so we went in, you know, snuck in there, gave about the coaches as well, and, um, you know, got, just got some uh, amazing feedback from guys that, and coaches that you would never even thought would, thought would say anything about it. Man, that's amazing. The good thing about you playing for the Saints uh, instead of the Patriots is that we, we knew you'd be available in January. <laughs> so. Oh, he got a shot. Hey, but guess what, though? That was pretty good, wasn't it? I got to give it to him. I got to give it to him. Because my son and I went to the Sugar Bowl this year. And oh, never mind. Never we went to, okay, my son win. and I went to the Sugar Bowl. Um, you know, Georgia wasn't in it, but we did win our bowl game, though. Yes. This year. <laughs> you did. I couldn't say that. Oh, man. Anyway, so. What does roll tide mean anyway? anyway. Don't, I don't even know what it means. Most people that are Bama fans never went to Bama or any university. We just say stuff out loud. So you call yourself a bandwagoner? I'm pretty much a bandwagoner, yeah. I just want to be on a winning team. But can we get back to— You, you are not back? on the team. 
you are on the bandwagon. That's why I came on staff at, at Liberty, because I knew we were on a winning track over here. That I, that I mentioned we finally made it to the big playoffs, and in a few That's years. That's what I'm talking about, Liberty? In a few years, That's we what I'm talking about. Georgia. I just want a Liberty hoodie so I, that I can wear around. We can hook you up with a Liberty hoodie, right? I just right? want a hoodie to wear. They're like 80 bucks, but we can hook you up with a Liberty hoodie. All right, uh, yeah, paycheck, paycheck deduct. <laughs> So recently, um, recently, uh, you know, so many of us heard about you, and we started to see you all over the, t you know, television. We started to, to just uh, see a lot of buzz about just your uh, your willingness to be outspoken, uh, just as a father and a as a, uh, you know, very visible leader. But you really, as just a believer, um, a about uh, you know all that's been happening in our nation with the Ferguson trial, with Trayvon Martin, and all that. And uh, some people might not be so familiar with. The, the Facebook post, and I know you were going to read that for us. Uh, so we'd love to just have you read that and then just give you some time to just go a little further in uh, and, and speak into um, just what was on your heart. And uh, yeah, would you, would you read that for us? I, I, I definitely will. Um, yeah, I, I know this past summer and year, were, a lot was going on racially in this country. And um, if you're not familiar with the Ferguson event, you know, you, you had a young man, young black man that was shot by an officer. There weren't any witnesses that we know about. Um, there were so many questions about the event, and it seemed to drag on for so long. And so this, this thing happened, I believe, in the summer sometime, or maybe um, early fall. But the decision about indicting the officer didn't come until December. Or, or November. And so there was all this build up and build up and build up. And I know you guys are busy. I'm busy as well. So I, I, I would see it at night on CNN every now and then and just kind of keep up with it. But there was such a build up about this whole thing. And so um, the amazing thing about, uh, well, the thing about race is in this country, it runs very deep. You know, it's, it's, it's something that is kind of like our black eye that we um, try to cover up you know, with the eye patch instead of really dealing with it. And we get on our, our, on our sides and we point fingers at each other and um, we, we talk about things that have happened and there's a lot of hurt and a lot of anger um, in the black community as well as the white community. Um, there is uh, so many layers to this. And I think, uh, you know, when I wrote this post, it was really just my thoughts. Um, we had just played a game, Monday Night Football, and we lost. And uh, we lost to the Baltimore Ravens, and that was a night that the I probably shouldn't have said that. That was that was a, that was a night that the decision came out uh, about not indicting the officer. And as you can imagine, social media went crazy. I didn't know about. It. I, I got out of the locker room, got dressed, came and saw my wife, and she told me they made a decision. And my my Facebook is lighting up. People are in tears. People are upset. Um, people are angry. And then that just turned into comments being made about other people so much. So I, I got home about one o'clock. I turned the TV on and kind of see it. And um, these are these are my thoughts about the whole thing. Um, I'm angry because the stories of injustice that have been passed down for generations seem to be continuing before our very eyes. I'm frustrated because pop culture, music, and movies glorify these types of police citizen altercations and promote an invincible attitude that continues to get young men killed in real life away from the safety of movie sets and music studios. I'm fearful because in the back of my mind, I know that although I'm a law-abiding citizen, I could still be looked upon as a threat to those who don't know me. So I will continue to have to go the extra mile to earn the benefit of the doubt. I'm embarrassed because the looting, violent protest and law breaking only confirm and in the minds of many validate the stereotypes and thus the inferior treatment. I'm sad because another young life was lost from his family. The racial divide was widened, a community is in shambles, accusations, insensitivity, hurt and hatred are boiling over, and we may never know the truth about what happened that day. I'm sympathetic because I wasn't there, so I don't know exactly what happened. Maybe Darren Wilson acted within his rights and duty as an officer of the law and killed Michael Brown in self-defense, like any of us in those circumstances. Now he has to fear the backlash against himself and his loved ones when he was only doing his job. What a horrible thing to endure. Or maybe he provoked Michael and ignited the series of events that led to him eventually murdering the young man to prove a point. I'm offended because of the insulting comments I've seen that are not only insensitive but dismissive to the painful experiences of others. I'm confused because I don't know why it's so hard to obey a policeman. You will not win. And I don't know why some policemen abuse their power. Power is a responsibility, not a weapon to brandish and lord over the populace. 
I'm introspective because sometimes I want to take our side without looking at the facts in situations like these. Sometimes I feel like it's us against them. Sometimes I'm just as prejudiced as people I point fingers at. And that's not right. How can I look at white skin and make assumptions about what, and not want assumptions made about me? That's not right. I'm hopeless because I've lived long enough to expect things like this to continue to happen. I'm not surprised and at some point my little children are going to inherit the weight of being a minority and all that it entails. I'm hopeful because I know that while we still live, we still have race issues in America, we enjoy a much different normal than those of our parents and grandparents. I see it in my personal relationships with my teammates, friends, and mentors, and it's a beautiful thing. I'm encouraged because ultimately the problem is not a skin problem, it is a sin problem. Sin is the reason we rebel against authority. Sin is the reason we abuse our authority. Sin is the reason we are racist, prejudiced, and lie to cover for our own. Sin is the reason we riot, riot, loot, and burn. But I'm encouraged because God has provided a solution for sin through his son Jesus, and with it, a transformed heart and mind, one that's capable of looking past the outward and seeing what's truly important in every human being. The cure for the Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, and Eric Garner tragedies is not education or exposure, it's the gospel. So finally, I'm encouraged because the gospel gives mankind hope. So I, 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 I literally sat, um, I, I, it's funny because when you write things, more starts to come out and you start to get through these layers, you start peeling back layers. So your first reaction is, I'm angry. Why didn't they do something about this? I'm sad because this kid died. What? And then you start thinking, okay, why am I sad? Why am I angry? Let, let's get to the root of this problem. And you realize that, you know what? Racism is simply a symptom. It's a symptom of a disease, and the disease is sin. And it's a disease that we're all infected with from birth. And so we need to get to the core root of the problem. You know, we can, we can try to legislate. You know, we desegregated, we did all those things, and we needed to do all those things. We have affirmative action, we have all these, these different rules, we, people come and speak about race, but if we don't ever get to the heart of the problem, I think we do ourselves a disservice. And so when I was sitting there, um, actually in Target parking lot, on my iPhone in the Notes app, literally uh, just writing, and I sent it off, I had no idea that any of this was going to happen, honestly. And um, the major thing is that I hear again and again from people who are you know, white, black, in between. Um, man, that's what I was thinking, but I just didn't know how to say it. So I think that there is a, a honesty that we need to have when it comes to race. You know what, we're different. And since we've known each other for about, I don't know, t through two hours, we've made some jokes. <laughs> And it's okay to joke around sometimes. We're different, you know. I made it here on time. I'm black. That usually doesn't happen. It's okay. <laughs> you know, some of y'all can't say that, but I can say it. But you know, we, we need to approach this a, a, a little more lighthearted, but understand that, you know what, I have the same propensity to be racist as anybody white in here, because I have a sin problem, and I have a pride problem, and I have a selfishness problem. And so when we look at it holistically, that, that's why I'm encouraged, because the gospel gives us hope. And the gospel, you know, before Christ, there's neither male nor female. You know, there's not Jew or Gentile. We, we are all one. And until we deal with that issue, we're just putting Band-Aids on bullet wounds, as we say. It's incredible, man. Amen. Uh, at the end of the day, if, if sin is the root, then slavery always becomes, some form of slavery always becomes the fruit. And if grace is the root, then peace becomes the fruit. And so how, how, how do we lock arms with you, man? How do we, how do we battle racism in this nation? Obviously, uh, we want to do that as believers, and we have a, a greater picture, and we know that it is a sin problem, not a skin problem. But how do we go lock arms with oh, those who don't even know the Lord, but yet want the same thing that we do? They, they want to see their children not judged by the skin of their color. They, wanna, they, they want their children to be given a fair trial, just not on the street. You know, but in a courtroom, how, how, how can we how can we just walk and navigate through that? Just give us some wisdom. Give us some practical advice. The number one thing I'll say is the body of Christ is to demonstrate it. The world is looking. When we go back to the Bibles, you know, giving Bibles to somebody who may not even believe in the Bible, people want to see authenticity. And when they look at the church and they see segregation in the church and, we, and they see the most racist people say that they're Christians, that's a problem. And so, as the body of Christ, we need to demonstrate what unity is. 
It doesn't mean we all look the same. It doesn't mean we don't talk about race. It doesn't mean we don't joke at times about race. But it means that there's a genuine love for people that don't look like you. There's a genuine respect for people that don't look like you or may not have may not been raised like you were. So as a body of Christ, we need to demonstrate that. You know, secondly, we need to pray. We need to pray for our nation. Um, like I mentioned in, in 2010, going to Cleveland was the first time that I really got with some brothers that prayed you know, for 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it was, on a, on a weekly basis. Now, now it, 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 with the Saints, we get together every week, once a week, on the Saturday before the game, that night we pray. And some of the things we pray for is the nation. We pray for our country. We pray for situations like these. You know, thirdly, I would say engage. Individually engage your culture. Be aware of what's going on. You know, we have the cure for a lot of our country's ills. But a lot of times we feel like we don't have a word to say to them or that somebody may, may, may not want to hear what we have to say. You have the truth. Share it. You know, share, share it on their platform. It, engage in what's going on. In, in the book of Acts, when Paul went to, uh, was in Athens, right? And he goes to the Areopagus, Areopagus and he's talking to the, the philosophers there. What was he doing? He was engaging the culture in what they were talking about, but ultimately pointing them to Christ. Right? So he was aware of what was going on. He was aware of where he was. He was aware of what people were thinking about. He was up on current events. He paid attention to the football games, or he paid attention to the race issues that were in the culture. He paid attention to all these things. He, he, he was learned in that, but ultimately, he pointed people back to Christ. So he entered the conversation here, and he said, okay, I hear what you're saying. How about, how about think about this? And the Bible says that they thought about what he had to say. People will think about what you have to say if you offer them a fresh point of truth, point of view. And then there's some people obviously don't want to hear anything you have to say and they're turned off their heart to heart. But you will be amazed at conversations you can have if you're bold enough to step into the arena, talk about these, these issues, and always steer people back to Christ. really great, great advice just for us to be on bended knee together, to pray together, and, and to make our, our voice known, and, and, and just to, to become an activist in our own voice, right, in, in speaking truth. Man, as, as you have made yourself very vulnerable in, in, in this thing, I, I know for, uh, for every side that somebody is clapping and, and with you on this, there's always been, that's also the critic. Um, and bigger levels, bigger devils. You know, very visible become, people become lightning rods for a lot of things. And um, I know that that's got to take its toll on you uh, as a leader. Um, and not only are people for you, but people are always all, also against you sometimes. So how can we pray for you? How can we pray for your wife, your children, your family, your witness as an individual? I know temptation doesn't go away uh, with all the things that you have on you, buddy. So um, how, how can we just commit, you're, you're among family here. We love you, and uh, how can we pray for you as individuals? Well, first of all, thank you for praying. David told me about the prayer room um, up here where you guys go and pray specifically for needs that we have, so, so thank you for that. And, um, you know, my family, we, we really, I feel like I'm among family. You know, there's nothing like being around a bunch of people that you don't know, but you do know them because they're believers, and that's a common thread. And so um, when my wife and I met at University of Georgia, and back in 2002, we got married in 2005, and I didn't know what was going on. I'm not going to lie. I was, I was like, we're getting married? Okay, we're getting married. Um, but we always said that our marriage was going to be our ministry. And we've been married almost 10 years. It'll be 10 years in July. And so the prayer, thank you. And so my, my prayer, my, my request is that you pray for unity in our marriage. You pray that we always make our marriage our ministry. And, and, you know, we started this Bible study where it was talking about marriage and the importance of it and how everything flows from that. So being a great parent, being a great friend, being a great teammate, um, leading your kids starts from your marriage. So my, I, I, my request is that you all continue to pray for my wife, Kirsten, and I, that we grow closer together and that we ultimately grow closer to God because when we do that, we will inevitably grow closer to each other and that we will make our marriage our ministry. Secondly, as parents, pray for my children. Um, we had this conversation the other day, my wife and I, um, just wanting them to, even though they grow up in a Christian home, kind of like I did, at some point, you have to take it for yourself. And... 
there are a lot of Christian young people out there. My kids are, are like I said, five, four, three, and one. They will at one point be in your shoes. And by the time when they get to be your age, I want them to be at a place where they have Christ in their life for themselves. It's not mommy and daddy's religion. We're not coming in on their coattails just because my parents were Christians, but that we as parents parent them and that they come to a point in their lives where they repent of their sins and give their life to Christ for themselves and they follow him for themselves. And, and, and that, that, was our, that was our conversation not too long ago. So praying for our, our marriage, um, which obviously will encompass all the temptations as well, um, and praying for my children. I would really, really appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Yeah, let's do that together. Can we pray for our brother and his family? Father, we thank you, God, for this great witness, Lord, and I, I pray for his family, Lord, specifically for his wife. I pray that she would not only be an incredible encourager, um, but also just a partner, God, and, and that she would, um, when he's gone and he's out ministering, that she would just sense that, God, you're the great provider and your presence would be with her. Lord, I pray that... Um, that she would have her faith based on um, just her relationship with you. And in, in the days where a husband can really provide, that's a good thing, but where, where Ben falls short, that she would just be so overwhelmed by your provision, God, that, that, that was, that's where she'd find her identity. I pray for his children, Lord. I pray that they would, his children would find their own faith. And Lord, even as he was sharing about his father, just um, sharing the gospel with him, I, I pray that uh, there will be opportunities for him to be a witness, to be a preacher to his own children over and over again, and they would own their own faith. They would not just be a preacher's son, that they would be um, a, a, someone who's come to you on their own. Lord, thank you for that. Lord, thank you that, that uh, we are family, that even though most of us are meeting Ben for the first time, he walks into an environment where he's among brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, and his family, we could do together not just for racism, but for so many other things, we could do together what we could never do alone. We pray this in your name. Amen. Can we thank Ben again? Just incredible, brother. We love you, man.